How are you doing? Hope you're okay. This week is the first of a two-parter. This episode is going to be quick tips for new EFL teachers only. So if you prefer just a very short form podcast with just a kind of like a bullet pointed list of tips, then this is the one for you. In the next episode, I'll be talking with the lovely Melinda Thomas from New Teachers Connect underscore IG. She's just the sweetest. And we kind of meet in the middle because she's from a state school in the US. I know I have listeners who are in that position. And I also have listeners who work in schools in non-native speaking countries. But because of the wave of immigration in the last few years, they have students with L2 issues. So hopefully there'll be something for everyone. We kind of go a lot more in depth into some of the tips. I give my tips, she gives her tips, and we don't know what each other's going to say. It's much longer, but I, I think it's a really interesting conversation. So, without further ado, I'm just going to give you my quick bullet point list of things to consider if you are a new teacher. Ready? Here we go. Hi, this is Erin and welcome to Everything EFL, my little podcast about English language teaching and other teachy stuff too. Credit and honourable mentions will be given during the episode or in the show notes. Let's crack on. Okay, so as a new teacher, you're going to get a lot of students asking a lot of questions that you're not going to know the answer to straight away. Your mind goes blank. Please do not blag. Say, I'll tell you tomorrow. Okay, that's all you have to do. I'll do some research. I'll ask my colleagues. I'll tell you tomorrow or I'll tell you after the break. Ask your colleagues. Come back. If you think it's worth it, put aside five minutes in your next lesson to explain it. But I think students really like this. They feel like you're really trying your best to help them. And it's a good learning experience for you too, because you kind of learn in the right way. You go and you do your research. Next, stop talking. It's not your show, okay? If that's your thing, go into TV. I don't know. But you are there to facilitate, to explain, to instruct And it really, really annoys me when teachers use this classroom as their own personal stage. And I've seen it when I've observed teachers before. It's very frustrating because it's just like a performance. It's not a performance. You're not a performer. Lower levels. Obviously, you're going to have to talk more, but you can ask lots of questions so that students get used to question forms. It keeps them on their toes. Okay. now, if students do ask a question, even if you do know the answer, throw it back to the class. You may get met with silence, but then that's when you say, okay, get into groups, have a chat, I'll give you a minute, talk about what you think the answer is, and then see what they come back with. If no one knows the answer, then you can talk. Resist the temptation to explain all the time, okay? Even if somebody says, you know, teacher, what's a frog? Show them a picture on Google. That visual stimulus is much better than you trying to describe it or trying to draw a picture. We've all done that and failed miserably. Another thing as well, um, we get taught in our CELTA courses or our teaching courses is concept checking questions and instruction checking questions. Use them. They're a brilliant tool. So again, you're not just sort of talking, you're not feeding the information to the students. You're asking them questions to see if they understand what you're saying. Never assume the student understands. Never say, do you understand? Now, if you need to know more about concept checking questions, look it up on the internet. Find good examples. I might even do a podcast on it actually in the future. Yeah, that's a good idea. Next one. Always encourage as much communication as possible, even at lower levels. Now, obviously, this is difficult, but I have what I call a student prompt sheet. So um, in the mornings, I will give them a list of questions. What did you do yesterday? Things like that. Um, Which sentence is correct, A or B? You could um, make little flashcards, throw them into a bag. And then, you know, every lesson you add, depending on what you do in your lesson, you can add a couple more questions. Is this correct? Is this wrong? Um, Put the correct preposition in this sentence, things like that. And then throw all these things into a bag. And as you're adding to them, you just end up this big bag of questions and prompts. And students can come in the morning and they can just dive into the bag, test each other, stuff like that. So like I said, if you write one or two cards every lesson, very soon you'll build up what I call a bag of stuff. Next, always ask more experienced teachers for help. This is so important. Staff rooms should be a place of nurturing, a place of communication, a place where you can vent your frustrations about your students, all of that. But mainly you should feel like you can ask anyone in that staff room for help. 
Next, review, 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 especially at lower levels. I did read somewhere, in fact, I think it was um, on Ollie Richards' podcast, I Will Teach You a Language. He says, your lesson should be 80% review, 20% new information. Now, I think he was talking about if you're learning a language individually, but I don't see why you can't apply this in some way to the classroom. Don't just go on to the next thing. Don't think the information is stuck in their minds just because of your, your fabulous context-laden lesson. You know, 24 hours have passed. A lot can happen then. They've got a lot of other things going on in their lives. So review, review, review. Now, this is a big one. Don't be intimidated by the amount of time it takes you to prepare. This will improve with experience. I promise you it will. I mean, I remember sitting there crying, spending hours putting together a, like a one hour lesson plan for my CELTA course. And I was thinking, how is this ever going to, how am I ever going to, you know, have a life if I'm spending like seven hours preparing a two hour lesson? It does get easier, I promise. Which leads me to my next point is, Organise. Save any materials you make or copy. Put them in a file, be it paper or electronic, it doesn't matter. Use a file for every course book you use. You know, you will use it again, so keep everything you use together and you, you just save bags of time in the end. If you know, oh, I'm going on to New English File, Intermediate, Unit 3, you've already got it there, you've already got the materials cut out, you've got your photocopiers, all of that makes so much sense. Now, again, going back to leaning on your colleagues, use the experience of these colleagues to build up a bank of fillers and warmers and things like that. You know, oh, has anybody got a game for this? Has anybody got a game for this? Because there will be times when you'll only have five or ten minutes left at the end of the lesson. Can't really finish what you're doing or you don't have enough time to start something else. So you just think, oh, I remember that game. Play it. Usually low to no prep games are good or something that's already prepared on a PowerPoint or, you know, maybe it's um, a game that you found online. But, you know, just make a mental note or an actual note of all of these things. So you've just got this arsenal of little games and activities that you can pull out whenever you need to, because believe me, you will need to. OK, so lesson plans, lesson ideas. Don't be afraid to take risks. I've said this before, some ideas will bomb, some ideas will fly. But, you know, this is where you just reflect and you move on. You know, there are so many reasons why a lesson could fail. It could be the students or the dynamics of the class. You could have misjudged the difficulty of the lesson. It could have taken far longer or far less time than you anticipated. It, it happens. Get over it. Reflect. So reflect. Let's talk about that. So if your lesson didn't go so well, why not? What can you do to improve it next time? And if it did go well, is there any way you can tweak it and improve it? How did the students react? Because sometimes you plan a lesson and then you get in the classroom and then you're like, oh, I've just had a really good idea. And it might work just kind of diving into that idea straight away, or it's just one that you can note down for next time you do the lesson. So constantly make those improvements on your lesson plans as well. Don't just pull out the same ones again and again, especially if you know you can improve them. So in terms of preparation, think about nationalities that you've never taught before. What linguistic and cultural issues can you anticipate? There are also other problems that you, you should be anticipating in the planning stage. Pronunciation, what vocab is going to create difficulty, what grammar difficulties are there, what grammar points don't exist in the language of your students. For example, articles don't exist in a lot of languages. Present perfect doesn't exist in a lot of languages. So are you going to have to kind of really approach the way you explain this or they discover the rules for it to really make sense? What contexts are you going to need to make it really clear for your students? Again, this is the kind of thing that gets easier as you go. Remember, this is a learning curve. Teaching is so many things, but it is a massive learning curve. And even for me, 15, 16 years on, I'm learning all the time. So my next piece of advice is travel, travel, travel. I think a lot of people do this kind of teaching because it does allow them to travel. But do your research, OK? You know, some countries might have a great lifestyle, but what about the rate of pay? Is it doable? If you want to work and also save some serious cash for your future, for your house or whatever, which countries would be better for that? But at the same time, look at the kind of lifestyle. Is there, is there a balance there? Does the lifestyle suit you? There's loads of information out there online to help you with this. And also, you know, talk to teachers in staff rooms. Invariably, they've travelled. You know, I don't think I've met a single teacher who hasn't worked in at least one foreign country. 
Okay, so in terms of job hunting, be prepared. It might take some time to get into a school, a language school full time. If you're looking for summer jobs, which is invariably a good way of kind of getting your foot in the door of some schools, I wouldn't apply for jobs any later than April. So if you're looking for a summer job, start applying in April. Otherwise, what will happen is the good schools will pick and choose the best teachers or the teachers who apply and you'll get stuck teaching in a maybe not so reputable school whose lack of organisation means that they're just trying to find whoever they can at the beginning of the summer and invariably you'll have a bad experience because if they're recruiting that late, it means there's probably a lack of organisation there as well and it'll be a total nightmare. And it will just be such a shame that if your first teaching experience is negative. Having said that, it does happen a lot. My first experience was doing six weeks in a summer camp just south of London. And I mean, I had a brilliant time and I learned a lot, but organisationally it was it was an absolute joke. Unfortunately, you will find a lot of schools like that, which leads me to my next point. Be prepared for an industry that is unstable and it doesn't protect its teachers. Be prepared to meet a lot of dodgy bosses. If you want to know a bit more about this, check out episode 23 where myself and Shane talk about owner types. Strap in. So look online for forums and for websites for, you know, recommendations for good schools and also blacklist websites that have schools to stay away from. And my final point, and I know this isn't possible in every country, but if you can, join a union. Now, in Ireland, the unions are slowly gaining strength. They were doing very well just before the lockdown and things started to be moving. We, they were working towards legislation being introduced to protect EFL teachers and to get them more included into the, the wider sector of teaching. Unfortunately, the pandemic has kind of put the kibosh on that for the moment, but fingers crossed that will get moving again. So that's it, guys. I mean, look, I'm sure there's a million things I've missed out here. So I'd love to hear your comments on social media. If you're an experienced teacher listening to this, please comment on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram and put your advice there as well so that new teachers can get as much as they can from this episode. So I think I'll leave it there for the moment and I hope you have a lovely week. Please tune in next week for my conversation with the gorgeous Melinda Thomas from New Teachers Connect. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. This podcast is free and always will be. So if you feel like giving something back, you can do one of the following. You can subscribe to the podcast on your preferred platform. Spare a few minutes and write me a five-star review on Apple or Spotify. Follow everything EFL on Instagram, Facebook or Twitter and engage with me and my followers. If you would like to contact me, My email is in the show notes. Finally, and most importantly, share this episode on social media and tell your colleagues. Share the love. Bye.